Are you looking for a stress-free summer? HelloFresh sends you foolproof step-by-step -step recipes and fresh pre-portioned ingredients to make mealtimes a summer breeze. Get 16 free meals plus three free gifts with code MLM16 at hellofresh.com MLM16. Some of the richest people we know claim to be self-made. Whether it's Donald Trump insisting, my father gave me a small loan of a million dollars, or Kim Kardashian's sage advice about just, get your fucking ass up and work. The idea of becoming a millionaire or even a billionaire is made to sound almost easy when you break it down this way, but is that really the case? Are billionaires really self-made at all? Can we really be just like them if we work hard enough? Hello everyone, and welcome to Multi-Level Mondays. I'm the Illuminati, and today we're going to be talking about the self-made myth and the way that it's been used to promote businesses. We've already spoken about lies that billionaires tell to seem more legitimate or trustworthy. The Silicon Valley startup myth, their carefully crafted images, their promise of sustainability and progressive ideals, all while avoiding taxes, lobbying for less progressive ideals, and even mistreating people behind closed doors. In today's episode though, we're gonna be taking a look at the people behind those images. Where do they actually come from? Let's start with the Kardashians and Miss Kim K herself, who so lovingly told her friends to just get up and work because no one wants to work anymore apparently. Although many acknowledge that Kim does have inherited wealth, some articles still insist that she's more self-made than people believe. One such 2021 article from Insider suggests that her inheritance could have dried up if it weren't for her business and social acumen. They give her credit for being a good business person as she's launched a mobile app, a beauty company, a shapewear loungewear line, and she has an impressive real estate portfolio. Of course, being a good business owner may depend on your definition of good, as she's also been sued for allegedly violating child labor laws and mistreating the cleaning and maintenance workers at her own home. She reportedly didn't give them meal breaks or breaks in general, and she didn't pay them for all the hours they worked. Not to mention those that have actually worked alongside her, such as the editor on the Kardashian apps, Jessica DeFino, have claimed that she was so grossly underpaid she couldn't afford gas to get to work. So is Kim really entirely self-made when she isn't paying the people that work for her a living wage? How much of a head start did she have exactly? Well, her father, Robert Kardashian, left his children $100 million in a trust fund. And yeah, it's not, you know, it's not very humble. If you ask me like 100 million, that is life-changing money. So if you can make $100 million dry up, as people have suggested, then I really have to question your spending habits. Kim insists that when she was 16, she didn't have financial help and she worked at a clothing store, but she also received a BMW for her birthday. Her father also gave her thousands of dollars to buy designer shoes on eBay, which Kim would resell for more to keep the profits. Again, while Kim may have a good business instinct in this regard, it's not exactly self-made when she needed thousands of dollars from family to get started. Many folks can't afford that much in designer shoes, even if they do plan to resell them. Now, that doesn't make Kim a horrible person, but it feels like a mischaracterization of what being self-made is. And while it just seems eye roll worthy or annoying in this case, it can be far more impactful. Now let's address Mr. Donald Trump, considering his a small loan of a million dollars comment has become pretty infamous in this regard. I'm pretty sure that everyone hearing this doesn't consider a million dollars a small amount by any means. When you're looking into real estate in New York City though, it could be considered that way. Not to mention, as Trump has insisted, a million dollars isn't very much compared to what he built. But is that actually true? Well, Trump had a lot more than one small loan. He also benefited from a $1 million trust set up in 1976 that would be worth around $4 million today. His father also gave him a $7.5 million loan. And according to his father's 1985 casino license document, Donald Trump owed his dad around $14 million at that time. It's strange that Trump says it was a small loan of a million when these documents are pretty easily available, but even stranger when you consider that Trump himself admitted in a 2007 deposition that it was more like the $9 million range. $8 million is a massive difference, okay? To say a small loan of a million dollars when it was really closer to nine, that's, it's kind of a big slip up. The Washington Post also adds, as Trump's casinos ran into trouble, Trump's father also purchased 3.5 million in gaming chips, but did not use them. A transaction that casino authorities later said was an illegal loan. One million, almost tens of millions. What does it really matter, right? Why should we care? Well, in the case of Trump, voters cared. Three surveys of eligible voters from 2016 to 2018 conducted by Politico found that half of the participants didn't know Trump was even born into an extremely wealthy family to begin with. Many thought that Trump was actually self-made and built his wealth himself. Therefore, they seemingly believed that he could take the same steps to build up the country. 
The idea of Trump being self-made actually leads to a 5% point boost in Trump's approval. So this myth has real quantifiable consequences. In 2018, when Politico asked participants if they were aware that Trump received millions and millions from his father to keep his businesses afloat, it had noticeable results, with perceptions of empathy for him plummeting more than 10% points. And that's among Republicans. And this example, it's a really good example of why I wanted to talk about this today. Like, we're just gonna be frank about it. It's clearly very important to the American people if someone is self-made or not. And to what extent they're being honest about it is also important. If we're going to have people running for office that mischaracterize what this is, it's far more important than a celebrity talking about their financial history. And for the record, if someone were to give me a small loan of a million dollars, or in this case, according to that 2007 deposition, a small loan of $9 million, I'm pretty sure I could make a business, you know, work on a much larger scale too, like just saying. And I'm saying that because it just points to the reality that you really have to like have money to make money. And so when you're born into money, your chances of being able to be a successful business person go way through the roof. So this whole myth is so interesting in that regard. But regardless of how you think about Trump, this proves without a doubt that people do genuinely care about the idea of if someone is actually self-made. But what does being self-made actually mean? Well, let's find out. The dictionary definition of self-made is obvious, to be made by oneself or to have achieved success or prominence by one's own efforts. Now, you could take this to the extreme level and say that no one is self-made because we're all made or shaped by the environment around us. But generally speaking, it means that you come from a disadvantaged background and were able to become wealthy in spite of it. It's an inspiring idea to be able to become so successful. It's an idea that Americans at least are obsessed with. And it's not hard to find articles online promoting the habits of supposed self-made billionaires and their motivations. One CNBC author said the biggest drivers between billionaires have consistently been to get out of poverty, solve problems, innovate, and create social impact. The CEOs and company founders with these goals supposedly wake up early, pursue passions, and have an exercise regime. They'll be as successful personally and socially as they are financially. CNBC also claims that they're frugal. Warren Buffett, for example, still lived in a modest Omaha house and Bill Gates was known for wearing a $10 watch despite his status. And as like just a side note that doesn't really matter at all, the amount of times I reread that line over and over again of modest Omaha house is saying modest Omaha house. I don't know why I'm saying it that way, but God help me today is not that day. Now, of course, now that these men have more money than they could ever spend, that's not necessarily the case. Gates actually has a literal personal collection of private jets. But the point is that these self-made billionaires had frugal habits. Even financial advisors have echoed these sentiments, telling people not to just buy Starbucks every day and they'll become wealthy. So as long as you aren't motivated by money alone, have healthy habits and know how to be frugal, you have all the makings of a self-made billionaire, or at least a self-made success story. And in my opinion, many people in poverty aren't necessarily concerned with frugality, but just surviving. Not overspending isn't exactly an issue for someone that's wondering if they can afford everything in their grocery cart. The reason why I wanna make a note of this because these lists are set up to seem inspiring. They have the attitude of, you know, just do this and you can be wealthy too. Not only are they misleading and misrepresenting many wealthy people's success stories, but I feel like they can breed a sort of self-loathing for people who don't make it, where they might blame themselves when truly the cycle of poverty is harder to overcome than listicles illustrate. Plus, if you are in poverty, you shouldn't be punished for spending $5 on a Starbucks drink you enjoy or blamed for trying to find small moments of happiness and joy by buying something that would make you happy. That's an insane argument. And as for that whole $5 Starbucks thing, that would literally only save you about $1,800 a year. And over 20 years of life, if you bought a Starbucks every single day, that would only be about $36,500. That's not a million dollars. So just kind of putting that out there. People are like, you'll be a millionaire if you stop drinking your fucking Starbucks. Like that's not the truth. The math literally doesn't add up. Now, as we saw with the Kardashians and Trump, a lot of extremely wealthy people do have what's known as generational wealth. That doesn't mean you're a bad person if you have a trust fund, but there's no denying the massive impact of this specific advantage. The Guardian wrote about some of the richest people in America during the pandemic, discussing how the Waltons, the family behind Walmart, Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk all saw profits or assets balloon during the pandemic. The rich really do get richer and they really wanna keep it that way. The director of the Institute for Policy Studies, Chuck Collins stated, if the system is functioning as it should, we should not see wealth acceleration over generations. It should be dispersing. 
But that's not what's happening in America. The wealth gap is growing, not shrinking, and there's a powerful wealth defense industry in the United States that sets up the next generation of inherited wealth dynamics. Bezos, who is largely considered to be one of these self-made billionaires, still received a quarter of a million dollars investment from his parents in 1995. And while Elon Musk is largely known as the genius behind Tesla to his fans, many who have dug into his background are disgusted to find that his father owned emerald mines in Zambia. The mining industry in Africa is known for terrible conditions in cases of child labor. It's infamous for being exploitative. Musk has insisted that he was never the beneficiary of his father's wealth and left South Africa at a young age before graduating college with a six-figure debt. Whether or not that's true, the idea of Musk being self-made is still questionable. Many know him as the founder of Tesla, and I think they've even referred to him as such before, but he's technically not that either. Musk isn't necessarily the genius behind the company. He's the wallet behind it. He paid his way up the corporate ladder from the early 2000s to 2008 until he became the company's CEO. The same thing happened years prior with PayPal, another company that he's claimed to be the founder of. Whether you believe he's intelligent or not, there's a distinction to be between acquiring and founding companies. Not to mention Tesla itself has received millions in government loans. So again, self-made? Where is the line drawn for self-made? Are you still self-made if you receive millions in government loans and government stimulus money when you're a trillion dollar company supposedly? I'm not saying that Musk isn't self-made in any aspect, but it does feel like the line is a bit more blurry than some people might think. Whether or not self-made billionaires and millionaires have been given trust funds, investments, or just cold hard cash, there are other aspects to being self-made that aren't really talked about. PBS discussed this in depth with millionaire tech entrepreneur, Jason Ford, who says that he didn't inherit his wealth, he created it. Yet by his own definition, he's also not entirely self-made. Quote, yes, my family background is rather humble. Both of my parents were teachers. I grew up in hand-me-down clothes from our neighbors. But before I was born, my parents got help from their parents to buy a house in a safe neighborhood with good schools. When my grandmother passed, she left each of her grandkids some money, not a fortune, but enough that I made it through college without school debt. Jason goes on to state that his wife's grandmother also invested in his startup, and he defines all of this as serious help. He adds that had his ancestors not been white, things would have been more difficult for him too. His grandfather wouldn't have been able to climb to the top of the corporate ladder. His parents wouldn't have been able to purchase the house they did. And therefore he would not have been able to attend the excellent schools that prepared him for college. Jason benefited from a butterfly effect of events. It's a good thing Jason used the tools he had and I congratulate him on his success. But Jason also acknowledges that this is truly what it means to be privileged. Despite humble beginnings, he still had tools and advantages that others in his position just wouldn't have. And a lot of the people that are on these like Forbes 400 lists are usually white men. And there is some exceptions, but there's definitely no denying that white privilege absolutely does play a role into the self-made privilege too. Now, there are millionaires that have been able to save, max out retirement accounts and grow their wealth in time, absolutely. Yet it's those who are most celebrated who dominate these Forbes 400 lists and such who are said to have made their fortunes entirely from scratch. And those are the ones that are most questionable in this regard. United Fair Economy found that 35% of those on the Forbes 400 list came from poor to middle-class circumstances, comparable to the current situation of about 95% of Americans. The rest, aside from 3% of those who grew up on the list that have no good paper trail in their economic backgrounds, all grew up in substantial privilege. Sometimes this privilege is extremely obvious with 21.25% of those on the list not having to lift a finger to earn it, just inherit it. However, about 22% of the list had inheritance of $1 million or less. So they did have to work to earn their status to some extent. The remaining percentages inherited more than $1 million, sometimes even tens of millions, but not enough to put them on the Forbes 400 without having to make a few investments of their own. United for a Fair Economy found that Forbes has glamorized the myth of the self-made man and minimized the many other factors that enable the wealth, such as inheritances, tax breaks, and other governmental policies. Again, this doesn't mean that those born into privilege should necessarily feel bad or guilty, unless maybe that money was earned by exploiting people, which is true far too often. So maybe there should be a little bit of guilt involved. But what this means in general is that we need to acknowledge why these advantages are going to make the rich rich. But aside from the background privileges, the inheritances, the education, and the other things that contribute to many of these self-made millionaires and billionaires, there are also the advantages that keep the rich folks rich. Primarily the tax breaks. Although Musk announced in December, 2021, that he intended to pay a record amount of taxes, $11 billion, he was accused of owing far more. 
Senator Elizabeth Warren described him as the world's richest freeloader after it was revealed that Musk paid zero federal taxes in 2018 and a tax rate of about 3.27% between 2014 and 2018 when you account for unrealized capital gains. And for the record, the average person in the top 1% of households pays about 25%, while the average of all Americans is about 13%. Now, of course, this is only including the unrealized capital gains like his stocks. There's plenty of debate about whether or not we should be able to tax these unrealized gains and at what rate we should be able to do so. Billionaires like Elon Musk may not have as much liquid wealth as they do money tied up in their companies, but that's still a lot of wealth for one person to have. It's even worse when you look at Bezos, who reportedly didn't pay a penny in federal tax income in 2007 and 2011. Garrett Watson, a senior policy analyst at the nonprofit Nonpartisan Tax Foundation, explained that business losses and charitable contributions can impact these frustrating numbers. And a ProPublica article on the matter says that the ultra-rich can purchase assets that go up in value, then borrow money against it. Once again, this results in consuming something tax-free. There are plenty of other policies aside from income tax breaks too. And big surprise there, considering that the 1% can afford to lobby to have their voices heard by those in power. Poor homeowners also pay more of their income and property tax than any other income group, and the wealthiest taxpayers pay the least. So are Bezos and Musk really self-made? To a certain extent, sure. But a lot of their wealth seems to be hoarded and held because the government just isn't taking away a fair share. Regardless of what you agree that number is, you can't really tell me it's right that Bezos didn't pay a penny in some years. So why does any of this matter? If you work hard, you should be able to keep what you earn, right? Well, aside from the hypocrisy and the unfairness of it all, there are other consequences to people hoarding wealth. And before we get into some of those consequences, we're gonna go ahead and place today's ad sponsor right here. Today's episode is sponsored by Honey, the easy way to save when shopping on your iPhone or computer. Now, I love that I can basically get everything online, but sometimes I can't keep track of promo codes because I have to save money when I can. So I've sacrificed my email to the savings gods. And sometimes it gets so overwhelming to look at that I'm not gonna look at it anymore. But now I have Honey to help find those codes for me. Honey is the free shopping tool that searches the internet for promo codes and applies the best ones to your cart. And I've been using Honey for many years, even before they ever sponsored the channel. They have helped me save money on everything from dog food to pizza night for D&D to makeup to clothing purchases to electronics, like you name it, Honey has been there. And now Honey doesn't just work on your desktop, it works on your iPhone too. Just activate it on Safari on your phone and save on the go. So if you don't already have Honey, you could be straight up missing out. And by getting it, you'll be doing yourself a solid and supporting the show. And I'd never recommend something I don't use. So if you wanna get started, make sure you go to joinhoney.com slash MLM. That's joinhoney.com slash MLM. Trying something new can be intimidating. Meditation may be something that you've been hearing about, but have yet to try for yourself. Calm helps you feel more at ease from the moment you start. Find somewhere that's comfortable and familiar to you, like a couch or a bed, and tune in to Calm. And yeah, I mean, technically this is an ad break, but our partners at Calm want you to focus on yourself for a moment. Take a deep breath and let it out. Relax whatever tension you're holding in. It's important to tune in and recenter, and Calm can help. And I'm excited to partner with Calm, the number one mental wellness app to help give you the tools that improve the way you feel. They've been helping me really refocus a lot of my anxiety through guided meditations, improve focus with curated music tracks and rest, and recharge with Calm's imaginative sleep stories. And it's for children and adults. So if you go to calm.com slash MLM, you'll get a special offer for 40% off a Calm premium subscription. And new content is added every single week. Over 100 million people around the world use Calm to help take care of their minds. And you should be one of those people too. I've become one of those people. And to be honest, it's been really nice to kind of wake up, get into the rhythm of doing a little daily meditation to start the day. And it really just helps me focus and align myself with what needs to be done. So for listeners of the show, Calm is offering an exclusive offer of 40% off a Calm premium subscription at calm.com slash MLM. Go to calm.com slash MLM for 40% off unlimited access to Calm's entire library. That's calm.com slash MLM. One of the most alarming advantages of being wealthy is the fact that your vote actually matters more. We're all taught in America that everyone gets just one vote and your voice matters. 
While that's true to a certain extent, the current system we live in is effectively giving wealthier voices a megaphone. For example, back in 2011, only about 6% of the public thought that budget deficits were the most important issue within the Obama administration. However, the wealthy prioritized deficit reduction over everything else. And it was the wealthy who got what they wanted, cuts in social security and Medicare in return for slightly higher taxes on the wealthy. As they refused to accept this increase, the deal sank, according to Paul Krugman of the New York Times. Other articles, such as those from the BBC, simplify the matter as follows. The rich rule because politicians are rich. So long as those in office are extremely wealthy, of course they're going to think of their own self-interest. This is exemplified in a powerful speech by Miss Hutchinson testifying before Congress about wealth inequality. In it, she mentioned that senators receive $40,000 as a furniture budget, and the actual compensation for most of them is $174,000. It would take nine people working full-time for a year at $10 an hour to match y'all's salary. She adds that despite her being tens of thousands of dollars above the poverty line, she's pulled myself up by the bootstraps so many damn times that I've ripped them off. And if we're not supposed to be buying extra things for our lives, how are we supposed to buy new bootstraps, right? I mean, I genuinely can't find new bootstraps on Amazon. (laughs) Now, I'm not going to say that it's impossible for someone with that wage to understand someone in poverty, but it's extremely difficult. And in my opinion, unlikely. Most of the time, the people that truly understand poverty are those who have actually experienced it. Growing up poor and being truly self-made genuinely changes a person's perspective and their political decisions too. The Washington Post found that Democrats with humble upbringings tended to favor policies that helped lift people out of poverty in terms of healthcare, welfare, and higher minimum wages. Republicans seem to be a mixed bag on all of this. But generally speaking, truly being self-made, having humble roots and beginnings does allow someone to see the world differently, to be more sympathetic to those that are struggling. It's why we shouldn't disillusion ourselves into believing someone is going to be understanding just because they throw the self-made buzzword around. The correspondent, which argues that there is no such thing as self-made billionaire, also argues that these consequences can be dire and at times overlooked. Uber wealthy figures can undermine democratic values through lobbying and campaign spending, all the while being far more involved in ecological destruction than the average person. According to French economists, Lucas Chancel and Thomas Piketty, lavish lifestyles tend to contribute about 30 times more to greenhouse emissions than the average person in a wealthy country, and up to 300 times more than the average emission of a person in a country with low emission levels. Some celebrities with jet setting habits may produce 10,000 times the average person. See Bill Gates's private jet collection for reference. But what does this have to do with being self-made? Well, having all of these privileges, the jets, the lobbying, the excessive wealth, it begs the question about if billionaires actually deserve all this wealth in the first place. When someone claims to actually be self-made, naturally people may be a bit more inclined to say, yes, they worked hard for it, so it's earned. However, as subjective as the question might be, there are those that have tried to give a definitive quantified answer. The Guardian reported in 2018 that Johann Segrist had coined the term of ERI or effort reward imbalance when discussing unfair compensation. The two versions of this are being paid too much for too little work or being paid too little for too much work. Either way, it's an unfair ERI. The latter one that I'm sure many of us can relate to is the feeling of being underpaid. However, it's the former being greatly overpaid that excessively wealthy people experience. Sociology professor Rachel Sherman suggests that wealthy people will justify their unbalanced ERI or even cope with their inner conflicts about having such lavish wealth by claiming to be self-made, no matter how true it is. She asked an interviewee if he deserved his half a million dollar salary at one point in her book, An Easy Street, The Anxiety of Influence. At first he said, quote, damn right, where I am today, I've earned every dime on my own. Eventually, the interviewee conceded that he'd received financial support from family, but it's this initial response, the defensiveness that I find interesting. And this isn't to say that this interviewee, whoever he is, doesn't deserve a high salary, but there's a difference between just working hard and deserving a good wage versus inventing a backstory that will justify that obscene amount to other people. This is why I appreciate the response of Jason earlier, who admitted that yes, while he worked extremely hard for what he has, he still recognizes the help he had along the way. There's no, I earned every dime on my own fallacy, and we need to stop pretending that millionaires and billionaires don't often have help because the reality is a lot of them do. More and more, this self-made myth has wheedled its way into the public eye and become a matter of fact. As The Guardian puts it, This means that rather than challenging inequality as it causes the stress, those at the top try to rationalize that they deserve what they have because they worked for it. And sometimes even when they don't work for it, the rich get the benefit of the doubt. It's not as if CEOs work hundreds of times harder than their employees, despite often being paid hundreds of times more. So then who is making these self-made billionaires? Who is really making Jeff Bezos, Donald Trump, Kylie Jenner, and other well-known examples of this trope?
More often than we'd like to admit, child labor and exploitation are behind these billion dollar behemoths. We've talked about it before with the cocoa industry and in the mica that goes into makeup. And these same dangerous business practices are present in the companies of those who claim to be self-made. For example, Amazon suppliers have been linked to forced labor in China. Some of their third-party sellers may be offering products made using labor from Western Chinese regions of Xinjiang. In other words, forced labor using Uyghur Muslim groups. These labor camps, which we've also spoken about previously, but was super, super suppressed by the YouTube algorithm, these folks can partake in everything from constant surveillance to mass sterilization and horrific human rights abuses. Yet Amazon brand products like Echo, Fire TV, Kindle, and other products that are part of the Amazon Basics line don't seem to have qualms about benefiting from this. Maybe it's not surprising then that Amazon as a company has also been accused of abusing its workers. You've probably heard about delivery drivers having to pee in bottles, workers' needs being neglected in favor of fast delivery times, and the heat strokes workers have suffered at warehouses. I'd love to see Jeff Bezos stand in front of these workers and the people that have suffered abuses at his company's hands and tell them that he's a self-made man. I'd hope that he'd be met with outrage and the sentiment that these workers made Amazon what it is, not Bezos. He may have created Amazon, but the term self-made sure feels hollow when you consider that it's been on the backs of exploited workers. But he isn't alone. Tech giants have been sued by international rights advocates over the deaths and injuries of child cobalt miners. Children risk their lives to earn up to $3 a day collecting cobalt for Tesla's cat batteries and various Apple products. Google, Microsoft, and Yumicore were also contracted in relation to this case. Children in the area were also 10 times more likely to have DNA damage or birth defects from the toxic heavy metal. Forbes has given their input on how Tesla should combat child labor in the Democratic Republic of Congo, stating that as many as 35,000 of the 255,000 cobalt miners in the country are actually children. Tesla could certainly establish a monitoring system at the mine sites, take collective action and hold mine owners accountable and establish safety standards to the mines they use. It may be difficult, but it is possible. A Swiss-based commodity trading firm, Trafigura, also offered insight as to how this would work in the World Economic Forum report. Though Tesla has reduced the cobalt in their batteries, this doesn't mean that they're actually ensuring that the cobalt they do use is free of child labor. Just saying, oh, okay, we'll use less cobalt, doesn't really address the source of the issue. It also seems as if Tesla has done this because of the increasing prices, as opposed to any ethical reasons. Other reports, such as those from the Beijing NGO Institute of Public and Environmental Affairs, or IPE, insist that Tesla's supply chain has been littered with environmental violations. Everything from their lithium batteries to their molding to their aluminum wheel has had a different problem with it. Tesla has claimed that this isn't the case and they've rolled out a green supply chain to track their Chinese suppliers, but the IPE fired back. Their lithium battery manufacturer had dumped wastewater containing chemical oxygen demand at a level seven times higher than the legal limit. Fortune writes. In another case, a company making die casting accessories for Tesla's aluminum alloy repeatedly violated environmental regulations between 2019 and 2021, including by dumping wastewater into a storm drain and was fined a total of $115,000. Another so-called self-made billionaire, Kylie Jenner, has refused to pay her Bangladesh workers. According to the Dhaka Tribune, the Global Brands Group or GBG had refused to pay its garment suppliers there after the sales dropped due to COVID. The Kendall and Kylie brand has denied this, claiming that they worked with GBG in the past, but not anymore. But does it really matter if they weren't working with GBG during the scandal or not? GBG has been a problem for a long time now, consistently leaving workers with poverty wages, poor workplace standards, and incidents of factory fires and collapses, according to Jacobin Mag. And for the record, and unfortunately, it's almost impossible to be a billionaire without exploitation or shady behavior. Finding an ethical hundred millionaire or billionaire is just like, I'm just not sure if it even exists because hoarding that much wealth feels intrinsically scummy to me. So the question here, is it really fair to call all of these billionaires self-made when there's so much exploitation that goes into the process? Forbes would argue it depends and they have a scale for billionaires. For example, they rate Oprah a 10, saying that she is an entirely self-made woman who got to where she is with no help whatsoever. And while I do have my issues with Oprah and I do have an episode dedicated entirely to her, I do largely agree that financially she's mostly self-made. They rate Jeff Bezos as an eight, Kylie Jenner as just a seven. Donald Trump rates extremely low on the scale at just a four. But whether you think billionaires are self-made or not, there's a lot more nuance and gray area to this. And I feel that the term is quite frankly, overused. Being self-made is not entirely a myth. It can exist, but it isn't attainable by just waking up at 4 a.m. and having a good mindset. Most of the time, someone has to set you up for success. While that's the painful truth, it's at least a bit more realistic. 
But with all of that being said, that's where I'm going to end today's episode of Multi-Level Mondays. I hope you learned something new here today. And if you did, make sure that you're liking, following, and subscribing to stay up to date with all the latest episodes. I wanna thank you for spending some of your time here with me today. I really do appreciate it. And I'll see you in the next one. Bye.